Hello and welcome to the final GIMP tutorial for Python Foo. In this tutorial we'll be modifying our last plugin where we had the LOMO effect and all of the code um, that we're looking at here is the same as the last video um, with just a few exceptions where we're going to add some options uh, for the user to make some choices. We're going to offer the user the option to have that blend tool come in from the top, the left, the bottom, or the right of the screen into the center, um, as well as from the four corners. We'll give them the options of which direction to come in from by using compass directions. So, you know, we can say, you know, start north, start northeast, start uh, east, that kind of thing. So the first thing, obviously, we would need to do is to change the registry and the function name. So I'm going to change the function name to Lomo opt instead of just Lomo. And then, obviously, in the registry, we have um, just the, the the changes that we would normally need. So um, adding opt in the right places, uh, adding opt for the menu item and also the ellipsis because we're opening up a dialog and all of those kinds of things. So just the, the basic registry edits that we would normally make. Now, because we're going to be taking a user input um, as well as the original um, image and drawable arguments that get passed into our function, we need to create a new argument for our function called direction. So this is the one that will refer to the user input for direction. I've also added the parameters for the direction in the bottom uh, down here. Now, if you remember the, um, the earlier UI tutorial um, that we looked at, um, you should recognize that this kind of setup with the nested tuples um, and nested lifts, uh, lists. This is very similar to the radio options that we looked at previously, but here we're doing the PF option, which is a drop down list. So the way the um, the drop down list works is basically to um, have all of the usual information, so the type, the name, the label for it, and the default value, and then the extras. Uh, the extras that we have is presented as a list. Now, as I said earlier, the metaphor I found easiest to consider when I was thinking about the direction that the blend would come in from um, was to use the eight compass points of north, northeast, east, southeast, and so on. Um, it's just worth pointing out that you'll notice that the default value is zero. What GIMP is actually doing is it's not going to look for and the default value to be one of the labels that are in the list. Instead, it's going to take the position of the items in the list. And as I keep on saying, um, computers start counting at zero. So the default value, if we want the default value to be north, um, then that's going to be the zeroth position. So the zero position, and then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So even though there's eight compass points, um, obviously the number we can go up to will be seven. So all of this is pretty straightforward so far, but the um, the tricky bit for this plugin was to alter the values that we pass into the PDB GIMP edit blend method that we used in the previous plugin. So I'll just quickly open up the previous plugin so you can see what we're talking about here. Um, all of this stuff is mostly the same, but the main one we're changing, uh, sorry, not that one. The main one we're changing is the blend mode. We had the blend mode previously down here. Um, and you'll remember all of these different options which are being set in the variables that we have up here. Now, if you just imagine for a second, if we're talking about the blend could come in from the northeast corner or the southeast corner or the southwest corner or whatever, um, then what we're going to be changing are these values here. The X1 and Y1 values are going to be different depending on what the user picks. So that's going to be something that we're going to need to work through, and there's probably a few solutions for that. I have a sneaking suspicion that I picked the slowest, hackiest way to do it, but the final plugin works, so to be honest, I don't care. Um, but the first thing I did was I created a variable for each of the collections of the GIMP edit blend arguments that would be possible. Okay, so just to explain that a little bit further, um, these variables in here, or these arguments that get passed in, that whole group um, is going to change depending on what uh, the user picks. Now, in reality, the only thing that's going to change is the X1 and Y1, 
but I was having trouble finding a way of um, accounting for that without making this whole list of um, of arguments uh, of a a, um, a value list that could be passed in. So what I actually ended up doing was breaking a a good rule for programming, that rule I talked about previously of don't repeat yourself, um, you can see in my code up here, um, I have repeated myself quite a lot. So the idea behind this is basically, um, I've got the basic um, variables up here, uh, so the blend mode, the paint mode, the gradient, all of those things that we looked at previously, they're up there. Obviously the layer is being established earlier when we create the layer um, up here. So really all of these um, blocks are the same because layer, blend mode, paint mode, layer, blend mode, paint mode, layer, bl blend mode, paint mode, they're all being set by these variables up here and they don't actually change. So they're kind of static variables if you like. They're, they're staying the same all the way through. But in each one of these you can see that when you get to the final um, four items, so what have we got here? So we've got layer width divided by two, zero, layer width divided by two, layer height divided by two. The last two, layer width divided by two and layer height divided by two, are going to be the same in every um, every iteration of this because again we're always going to be ending in the center of the image. So the only ones that change are actually the um, these two here, the, what's labeled as x1 and x2. So if you're coming in from the north, so the, the kind of top center of the screen, then obviously the x axis is going to, the x axis is going to be layer width divided by two, so it's in the middle of the screen, and the y axis, because the y axis is flipped um, in the coordinates for um, the GIMP, um, the y axis will be zero because it's going to be right up against the top. But that's going to change. Um, depending on where we're coming in from. So the only thing I had to change was the code for the X and the Y starting positions. But it's a little bit confusing. I mean, you can see what I actually ended up doing there. But the reason it's a little bit confusing is it's hard to visualize, I think, um, what code we're looking at. So I quickly put together something just to make that a bit more obvious. Okay, so this would be the kind of pixel positions that we're looking at. Okay, If we're imagining we're coming in from the top right hand corner to the middle and they're always ending in the middle which is why it's going to be layer dot width divided by two, layer dot height divided by two. Um, I drew up this quick uh, reference map for me um, so I could just figure out the what the northeast value had to be, what the east value had to be, what the southeast value had to be and so on. So I used this kind of reference map to figure out my code. So for example, you can see that if we go from uh, the northwest, um, the value for x and y should be 0 and 0. So we can just check that to make sure I got that right in the actual code that I did. So for northwest, uh, you can see here I had 0, 0. Okay, so that's basically all I did there. So the principle behind this was to basically set up this group of arguments um, as a variable on its own, so this huge long um, you know, list of values or collection of values even, um, that's being stored in this variable of n so that when I have my GIMP PDB, uh, my PDB GIMP edit blend, I can replace all of that in theory with just an n and then it will put all of that stuff in. That was the theory I was working with. Uh, it ended up not being quite as simple as that, but that was what I toyed with to begin with. Okay, so that was the first principle, okay? The idea that I had to be able to say, I was gonna be able to drop something into GIMP edit blend that was just a very simple thing that would kind of account for all of these um, eight differences. So that was the first principle I had to use. The second principle I had to pay attention to um, actually introduces a really powerful uh, concept for us in our programming. Um, and this is called uh, conditional um, programming or using conditional statements or if statements. Now, just to give you a brief overview of conditional statements, I'm going to open up the console window and I'm going to show you a, a simple example of a conditional statement just so you can see what we're working with. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to create three possible conditions and provide three different responses based on which one of those conditions is met. So we'll create it as a function because that will be nice and easy for us to repeat. So I'll say um, we'll define the function and we'll call it, uh, let's just call it greater. And then we'll have our parentheses. And in the parentheses, we want our two arguments, A and B. Um, now, because I'm creating a function in the console, um, the ellipsis tells me that I haven't finished making the function, but um, you'll remember I need to indent to nest um, the, the next steps in this function into the thing. So I'm going to use uh, two spaces to be my indenting. So in the future, when I say indent, I just mean go in by two spaces. So we indent, and what we will do first is have our first condition. We'll say if A is greater than B, and then we indent to the if statement, but then because we've got another colon up here, we need to indent into this again. Okay, so that's four spaces in total. Um, so if A is greater than B, I'm going to print uh, A is greater. Uh, I can indent again. I'm going to say L if, L if, uh, that stands for else if, but it's just a quicker way of typing it. We say B is greater than A, so indent wants to come into the function, then indent another time to come into this conditional statement. Uh, we'll say print B is greater, and then we'll have a final statement else uh, print same same okay so what this will do it will basically say um, we're going to pass two numbers in as our arguments if a is greater than b it's going to say a is greater if b is greater than a it's going to say b is greater but then we've got this final condition where neither a is bigger than b nor is b bigger than a so obviously that means a and b must be the same so if a and b um, are the same it will print um, our final statement okay so i just press enter twice for that so then i can say greater so we just call the function uh, we'll say one two oh, we will do two one first we'll do them in order so that's saying a is greater we can try test the other way around b is greater and then we'll finally just test that the else value works so two two same, same, but different. So just to go through this line by line, obviously we've set up our function here with our arguments. We have a conditional statement where it's basically saying, if the condition A greater than B is true, then run this line. If that's not true, then ignore this line and instead check this line. So else if B is greater than A, print this line. And if that's not true, then we've got a backup one and you can print that line instead. So basically it will just keep on testing different logical conditions until it meets the one that passes. If none of them pass, it won't run any of them. But because we've got an else in there, it catches every other um, possible scenario. So that's the principle that we're gonna be using and that should be pretty readable and you should understand what's going on there. Now, when it comes to our actual plugin, the condition that we're going to be checking is the, sorry, let me just find it. The condition that we're going to be checking is what option the user picked. Obviously, if the user picks north, then we want the uh, blend to come down from the north. So we want it to pick, um, that blend option that I created up here uh, north. Obviously, if they pick NE, then we want this one to run. If they pick E, we want this one to run. So we can see that we're gonna be setting that up as an if statement. So the way that basically looks here, um, you can see this kind of laid out here, and it should be pretty readable. We've got lots of L ifs in there, which basically means we've said, um, if they picked position zero in that list, so if they picked N, then run N. If they picked position one, so if they picked northeast, run northeast, and so on, until we get to the final one. If they didn't pick any of those compass points above, then they must have picked uh, northwest. So that should um, be pretty straightforward, and you should understand what's happening there. The only thing that's a little bit um, unusual um, is the asterisk that I've included. Now, this was the part where I feel like I was being a bit hacky, and I didn't really know what I was doing. The asterisk is there because for some reason when I was running this and when I was testing this, 
um, GIMP kept on giving me an error message in the console that was saying I had the wrong number of parameters for the um, the blend um, options. Now I I checked the number of blend options I had again and again and again. It, it didn't work, so I couldn't figure out why there was a mistake. And after some googling, I found that you can actually use an asterisk when you have um, a variable number of um, values attributed to a variable. So if sometimes the variable might have five values attached to it, or sometimes it might have three values attached to it, um, the GIMP might, or Python might respond in weird ways. Whereas if you tell it with an asterisk that what comes next could be a different number of parameters depending on what the user has put in, it kind of knows to deal with it slightly differently. I don't think the way I've used it is actually the kind of case that it's designed for, but it happened to work. So even though it's not best practice, the fact that it worked was good enough for me. So I basically go in, I fill in all of those conditions, and then it works. So basically, when I saved my um, work and ran it, it worked. So you can take my word for that, or you can see me actually do it. So I'll just open up the tutorial. We'll go to filters and Lomo option, and this time what we get is the direction thing come up. So let's come in from the south, and you can see what happens. Okay, so you can see it's darkest down here and lightest up here because the blend is going this way. If I were to undo that and go in from the opposite direction, you should see the difference that we have. So I'll come in from the north. And now we've got it dark up there and lighter down there. So all I wanted to do was give people the option of choosing where that blend comes in from, just so they can have a bit more flexibility with um, the way that plugin works. The the previous one, the, the one without options, always comes in from the northeast. And you might find with some images that you don't like that. So giving people eight compass points to pick from gives them enough flexibility that I think they'd be happy with that. Anyway, so that was the last tutorial. Uh, that tutorial I realized was a bit different to the previous ones because I didn't really show you me making any code. Um, we just kind of talked through what I did in a script. Um, but I hopefully um, picking up that last bit of knowledge about how to use conditional statements will be something that you will find very helpful in either future plugins or in future um, Python projects that you might decide to work on. Anyway, this has been my last Python Foo tutorial. In all likelihood, it will be my last GIMP tutorial because I am getting pretty sick of GIMP tutorials. But stay tuned, I'm sure there will be something else in the pipeline in the not too distant future. So thanks for watching this series, I hope you found it useful. And um, thanks for watching, and I will catch you somewhere some other time.